Some of the trips that I took, this is in northern Pakistan, um, the first descent of a river called the Indus. And it was interesting that on this trip, um, I was brought in line with Mick Hopkinson, who'd been on that original expedition to the Dude Cozy with uh, Dr. Jones. Um, from here, I started to get into the world of production. Um, the era of video and social media came about and I started to turn my expeditions into a kind of production media-esque type platform. We're looking at Mirror Peak in the Himalayas and um, this was a trip that I put together where we started to film and write and um, take photographs on the expeditions that we were on and marry them with corporate sponsorship. So I'd kind of gone from the guiding world to putting expeditions together, then producing content. And today's world of content-driven media, it's a great way to kind of fund yourself and participate in terms of going off on expeditions and making a living out of it. Um, this is at 22,000 feet. This is my colleague Reggie. It's Everest in the background with the plume coming off of it. And by this stage, we were beginning to get a little bit creative. We were climbing peaks, we were skiing off them, and then we were kayaking down into the subcontinent. So we're kind of, you know, addressing a, a, a different set of outdoor pursuits, and we kind of knew how to get our way around. We knew how to capture this content, and we knew how to turn it into to television. So we're beginning to kind of find our, our stride. Um, and what was cool about this was this was the last river I had to do, which was in fact the Dude Cozy. So it was nice to kind of go full circle and paddle all the major drainages in the Himalayas and then finish with this river that this guy, Mike Jones, had kind of really inspired me to get out there in the first place and, uh, and get to grips with. Um, I kind of knew that, you know, I'd gotten to the point where I, I, I had my finger in the expedition world. I was working as a full-time guide, and then in my spare time, I was going off and exploring various different regions. And the guiding aspect, again, gave me the financial um, capability then to go off and explore different regions. And they, they began to link into each other, and I formed my own company, and then I could go to regions of the world that I just traveled in. Um, at this stage, I, I was very interested in Everest always, and I'd been there since the early 80s, prior to the commercialization of, of big expeditions um, and commercial activities on Everest itself. And I bumped into this guy, um, Anthony Geffen, who owns a company called Atlantic Productions. And uh, Anthony was head of BBC documentaries for over a decade. Um, he was in Tannerman Square. He'd spent six months with Saddam Hussein. He'd uh, done a bunch of time with Gaddafi, and he was a, an amazing guy. And the reason I'm touching base on this guy is he had a very great close friend called Frank Wells, who was the head of Disney, who was killed in a helicopter crash. And Frank had been trying to climb Everest as part of um, an endeavor to be the first to do the Seven Summits a while back. Well, Geffen had an idea. He wanted to go back and pay tribute to... Um, his friend Frank Wells by making a documentary about Everest. And what had never been done to the full extent was a film on this man. And in terms of expedition leading, this is a guy that always had, again, had a profound impact upon me, and his name was George Mallory. So I was invited on the expedition to go and do and create a film on the life and times of George Mallory on the north side of Everest. So from 1920 to 1924, Mallory mounted three different expeditions to Everest and was tragically killed on the last one. And his mentality was very much, I'm either going to summit or I'm going to die trying, which is a little bit more of a commitment than I wanted to kind of give to the project. Um, I hadn't spent much time uh, in the high Himalaya, and so part of the film, a behind-the-scenes focus, was based on myself having not been a prominent mountaineer and attempting Everest for the first time without um, having much in the way of, of expedition experience. So off we went, the north face of Everest, and it's one thing to be climbing on Everest, but it's another thing to be doing a major production on the mountain. We had nine different cameras on the north face of Everest, all shooting in high definition. So the logistics of moving batteries and tape from 23 to 27,000 feet down the mountain to Advanced Base Camp 
22 kilometers out to base camp, recharge everything back into advanced base camp, and then back up onto the mountain to get the shots to create this film was, was pretty incredible. There was a Discovery Series um, shot, and we used the same outfitter, a guy by the name of Russell Bryce, who's pretty much the man up on Everest. He's been there since 75, and he was our logistical coordinator. But moving stuff around at altitude, especially above 26,000 feet in the death zone, is a, is a major achievement. Um, so this is what we were doing. We were recreating the story of George Mallory. And the main climber we had with us was a guy by the name of Conrad Anker. And Conrad actually discovered Mallory's body frozen in time in 1999 high 27 and a half thousand feet on Everest. And the question was, did Mallory summit Everest and die on the way down, or did he die before he got to the summit? And then historically in mountaineering, that would be a significant revelation because then Hillary technically wouldn't have been the first man to climb on Everest. So we, last, we know that he was last seen at 27,500 feet on the north face, disappeared into the clouds with Andrew Irvine, and then was never seen again. And then 75 years later, he's found perfectly preserved high on the mountain. It's a desert up there and he's frozen in time. So we went back to recreate the story to investigate exactly what had happened in 1924. We had access to Mallory's diaries, and we had all the primary source information, and we even we went back and our climbers were dressed in exactly the same equipment that Mallory and Irvine were dressed in in 1924. So this is actually the highest piece of drama ever shot in the world, about 24,000 feet. It's minus 50 outside. Batteries last about two and a half minutes before you have to take them out, put a new one on. And we are shooting an exact replica in exactly the same place. And this is the a photograph from 24 of present day. So the film that we actually did was a, a movie called The Wildest Dream. And you can get it on Netflix. It's a wonderful historical uh, documentary of, of the life and times of Mallory. Heading towards the summit of Everest, for me, it was, um, it was a daunting task. You know, you don't know how you're going to perform. You've been on the mountain now for um, 50, 60 days. So you're acclimatized, you're ready for your summit push. Now, towards the top of Everest is what's called the second step. And we know that Mallory would have had to free climb the second step to get onto the summit ridge to reach the summit. 1975, the Chinese put a ladder up which kind of took out the technical aspect of climbing. But back in 1924, we knew that Mallory would have had to free climb. So the climbers put themselves in a position. The deal was that we went up, we cleared the second step at 28,000 feet, cut out all the ropes, took out the ladders, and recreated it exactly like it would have been in 1924. And then today's top mountaineers, a guy by the name of Leo Holding and Conrad Anker, then went into place and attempted to free climb the second step, surmising that if today's top boys couldn't have done it, the chances are in 1924 that Mallory wouldn't have been able to do it. So after months and months of preparation and training, we headed off for the summit. And it's pretty cool. You get up onto the summit ridge. This is about just below 28,000 feet. You've been on the north face um, your entire expedition. And once you get up here, sun's breaking, you actually see the curvature of the earth. So this is where you drop your old oxygen tanks, put your new tanks on, and then head for the summit. And this is me filming Conrad just before the second step. Everything's been put into place for this kind of penultimate moment. Cameras are on different angles. People are shooting from two miles away. Cameras are above, cameras are below. So to put this whole production in place, we wait for the sun to come up and hit the face itself. And then Anthony Geffen, who's three miles away looking through a telescope, shouts, action. So it was a pretty cool kind of moment to, to be in this place. And then these guys go ahead and attempt to do the second step. We get up beyond the second step, third step. This is the last few feet before you reach the top. Um, it's a fairly emotional feeling. Also, what we're battling now is the monsoons are just arriving. So we've had to wait till all the commercial expeditions are off Everest because you can't very well go up and take the ladder down while people are still climbing. So that means that we've butted ourselves right up against the monsoon. 
and then once the jet stream moves off the summit of Everest, the monsoons come in and the mountain closes down. And it actually happened that we, we were the latest to ever summit Everest and the monsoons, this is the monsoons arriving as we reach the top. So it all kind of came down to this incredible um, area of luck and window and the tension was, was pretty high. We ended up having a, a fairly epic retreat which took some 14 hours to get off and, and we were pretty lucky to get down in one piece. What we do to kind of finish up as an expedition leader, um, myself and my partners, uh, we run guide training programs that are experientially based and we're here to match you with a career, with a path in the commercial world of adventure travel. So the trips that we run are specifically based in the Himalaya and whether you want to immerse yourself and learn how to become a raft guide, an oarsman, a whitewater kayaker, a trek leader, or whether you just want to actually get a really good grounding in a, in a new activity and come out with a level of proficiency that allows you to go anywhere in the world um, and pick up a new sport, that's the kind of programs that we're involved in. Um, rafting is a great way to make a living. It's seasonally based and um, you typically are working three months in one country. I, I work three months in the Himalayas, then I work in, as a, a ski guide in the Rockies and then I come back to the Himalayas and I typically work production in the summer. So this guiding aspect of the responsibility of uh, looking after people, taking care of business and having the leadership skills has all kind of come from my experiences working as a guide and, and that's what we've put together um, and that's the, the, uh, the trip that I'm here to kind of sell to you guys and, and get you involved in. But if you are looking for a change in life, if you're looking for an activity that gives you a career that allows you to travel and uh, make a good living and take it to any direction you want to go. Some people move into multimedia, I went into production. Um, some people go into uh, creative design. It's, it's a good foundation to have to enter into the outdoors.